So now we finish up with the return from exile. Okay? And uh, please turn to the book of Ezra in your Bibles. Uh, turn to Ezra chapter 1. We will primarily be looking at the historical books of Ezra and Nehemiah today. Uh, also Esther, but primarily Ezra and Nehemiah. And then the prophetic books of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So that's what we're covering here today. But we also uh, need to make reference to the two books that are called Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles. Uh, because this is also a history of the people of Judah. And um, it parallels much of what we saw in 1st and 2nd Kings and um, so I've laid out for you here um, kind of how the chronicler as the author is oftentimes called divides up or, or has, has laid out and actually the division is, is not original with the original author it's a later division between the two books here as well. Um, just want to welcome my father-in-law. Last week, my father was here, and my father-in-law here, Pastor Don Kirst, and uh, so happy that you can be with us, Dad. Okay, so uh, First Chronicles then essentially covers from Adam to David. Okay, uh, mostly the account of David, the monarchy. David is kind of the hero uh, for First and Second Chronicles. And then 2 Chronicles from Solomon to Cyrus. Okay, so from Solomon, the united monarchy through the divided monarchy, the fall of uh, Judah, uh, the captivity, and then it finishes with the hopeful edict of Cyrus for the Jews to return. Okay, so um, the emphasis here is primarily on David and Solomon, though and especially uh, the building of the temple and uh, the, the establishment of the uh, temple worship. Uh, the focus is ex pretty much exclusively when you get to the divided kingdom on Judah's history. The northern kingdom is pretty much just ignored uh, because of the focus on the da Davidic dynasty and since the northern tribes rejected the, the Davidic dynasty, they're pretty much ignored in this history. It's again a somewhat of a priestly perspective, uh, focus on the temple worship uh, like the priests would be doing, and gives the temple and the Davidic dynasty high priority. Okay, uh, Again, we don't know who uh, wrote First and Second Chronicles, or for that matter, Ezra and Nehemiah, because they're a continuing piece here. Uh, and there's good evidence that it's the same author who wrote Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. In fact, also originally, Ezra and Nehemiah were one book, and they were somewhat artificially divided up uh, at a later time. Uh, the traditional view is that Ezra is the compiler and author of these pieces, but we don't know that for sure, so sometimes the author is simply referred to as the chronicler, okay? Um, but uh, the history that's provided, especially in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, is really, really very excellent, uh, what we'd call superb historiography. Um, you have the use of authentic uh, memoirs, first-person memoirs from Nehemiah, from Ezra, for example. Uh, you also have um, autobiographical material from, from others. Uh, some official documents, uh, even from the Persians, uh, written in Aramaic, uh, distinct language even from the Hebrew, and uh, quite a bit of reference to various historical documents. So uh, pretty excellent uh, historiographer. And yet, uh, the writer has a theological bent or slant to the writing, which is uh, unabashed. 
and uh, so he will select and edit for that message. Um, and essentially the message here is one exile is enough. Okay, Let's learn from our past errors. So you get the, the, the reference to what happened before the exile in the Chronicles uh, and shows the errors of the people primarily and then uh, the post-exile uh, account here um, shows how the people learned from that or maybe didn't learn. And so it, in a sense, stands as uh, a lesson for the reader. Uh, please learn from what happened with the exile. Okay? So just setting us up for the historical context here, uh, we saw the first deportation from the northern kingdom in 721. Uh, the ten tribes were dispersed throughout the Assyrian Empire. They were uh, assimilated and amalgamated within the empire, and so you have essentially the disappearance of the ethnicity and the cultural identity of those tribes. Um, then in 597, you have uh, the second deportation. The first one was fairly insignificant in 605. The second one uh, where you've got 10,000 um, uh, Jews who are deported. And then in 587 with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the mass deportation of Jews to Babylon. But as we've seen already in Babylon, these people continue to um, have distinct uh, community ties with one another. Uh, they, they are distinctive in terms of their ethnicity and their culture and, of course, their faith. And so they retain that. And this makes it possible then for them to uh, eventually return. And the first return back into the promised land to Judah will take place in 538, okay? Um, what makes this possible, this return, is a change in <laughs> rule, in administration. And here you have a demonstration of the changes in empires that took place that are especially significant for the Old Testament. The Assyrian Empire, remember Assyria was the uh, empire that assimilated the ten northern tribes, destroyed the northern kingdom and assimilated the people. Now the Babylon, Babylonian Empire takes over here, primarily in the uh, 6th century BC. And uh, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar are those who destroy uh, Jerusalem, the temple, and deport the Jews then to Babylon as exiles. Um, but the Babylonian Empire, as you can see here, was relatively short-lived. Uh, didn't even exist a hundred years. And it is taken over by the Persian Empire, which that is dated beginning 539. And the great Persian emperor who uh, initiates this is Cyrus, called Cyrus the Great. Okay. And you remember that Isaiah had foretold that Cyrus would be the one who would be God's instrument, his anointed one, God's shepherd, to bring the people back to the promised land in Isaiah's chapters 44 and 45. So uh, we have that promise uh, taking place um, here with, with Cyrus. Uh, Cyrus was a fairly humane and enlightened ruler when he took over now empires of uh, this far-flung region with many, many different nationalities and cultures and so forth. He spared the kings, so very unlike the Assyrians, who were quite uh, tyrannical and terroristic. Um, uh, Cyrus was quite humane, and, and uh, probably one of the most famous stories is uh, the conquest of Lydia and King Croesus, and he's an example of how Cyrus treated uh, a king with 
uh, a humane approach. Uh, he would also protect the conquered regions in terms of their culture and also in terms of their economic livelihood. He didn't just plunder them. He didn't just um, uh, e extract tribute from them and bleed them dry. But uh, he actually would support them and help them economically. And we, we, we read that here in these accounts where the Persian kings will send the Jews back uh, with much resources, uh, much support financially and uh, raw resources, treasures, and so forth. Okay. Cyrus also respected the various religions. So he didn't force his religion on uh, uh, the various uh, peoples of his empire. Um, and he also repudiated deportations. And so the deportations that had taken place under the reign of the previous emperors, the Babylonians now, uh, he makes the edict that uh, the peoples can go back, go back to their original homelands. Uh, and return. And then he would support even the rebuilding of their cities and of their temples. And that's what happens here as well. And we have extra biblical um, uh, evidence of all of this as well in what's called the Cyrus Cylinder, uh, as well as some others uh, where Cyrus uh, says that uh, uh, the conquered peoples, the deported peoples can go back. No doubt he also had specific edicts, and one of them is provided for us here in Ezra chapter 1, uh, where it would be specifically addressed to a people group, in this case, the Jews who were in exile. And uh, this same edict is repeated from, if you want to just flip the page over, the very last chapter of Second Chronicles, right at the end of Second Chronicles in chapter 36, verse 22, uh, which again shows the continuity uh, between the two. But it also recognizes that even in the original construction, uh, these would be two literary works, two uh, compositions, distinct compositions, what we call Chronicles and then the beginning of Ezra. Okay, So uh, that, that uh, edict is, goes forth okay, in five 38, very shortly after the establishment of the Persian Empire. And so now we'll have uh, uh, any questions on that first. Yeah. So what was uh, the motivation of Cyrus then? Was it just prestige of having a bunch of land, or did he still take enough tribute to make him better off? Yeah, yeah. There, there still are, I mean, he's not completely altruistic and benevolent to, to all of the subjects. So um, the, 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 the uh, vassal kingdoms in his empire in this realm are still subject to him. And uh, the, uh, they will be subject to the Persian rule, uh, which includes then any kind of uh, defense of the empire or further conquests, the, the, the supporting nations are to contribute to that uh, in terms of resources, in terms of manpower, and so forth. And, uh, and there still is, there still are taxes and so forth. He's got administrative districts throughout the em empire that are called satrapies, and the uh, uh, administrative officials are called satraps. And, um, uh, so they're still are they're receiving taxes and so forth, but it's not the extreme uh, kind of uh, you know just bleeding a nation dry with tribute that you'd see in previous um, regimes. Okay. Any other questions? Now we come to uh, the return to Judah of the Jews, and it is now after the exile that the Bible starts using the term Jews, okay? So it's not until then. Uh, before then, you have Israelites and uh, Judahites, okay? But now you have the return of the Jews, 
because these are primarily descendants of Judah. Okay, so that's where the word comes from. Uh, there are really two tribes that return, though, and we hear reference of this in Ezra. The tribe of Judah and which other one? Do you remember? Benjamin, right, because Benjamin has essentially been assimilated into Judah. If you remember way back in the period of the judges, the tribe of Benjamin was almost annihilated, uh, but it continues on uh, existing alongside the tribe of Judah. But uh, a small minority of people are actually descendant of Benjamin from this, this whole group. The three migrations then occur in 538 BC, uh, immediately after Cyrus's edict, and these can be considered the pioneers, the first ones to go back to the, the uh, ravaged land of Judah. Uh, they are led especially by two individuals named Shesh Bazar and Zerubbabel. You don't really need to know Shesh Bazar for the exam. You will need to know Zerubbabel, though. Shesh Bazar is kind of the figurehead, okay? And uh, it's clear that he is of the Davidic line, okay? So he is the leader, and part of the reason here is because the leader, the ruler, if you will, is from the line of David. And um, so Shesh Bazar here uh, probably is the son of Jehoiachin, uh, that king who was taken into captivity, who nonetheless has died in Babylon, okay? Uh, Zerubbabel also is of the line of David and probably also, some say, perhaps a grandson of Jehoiachin. Uh, probably not the son of Sheshbazar, though, but uh, maybe Sheshbazar was the uncle to Zerubbabel. We're not quite sure what the relationships are there, but we do know that they're both of the line of David. So that Davidic dynasty is carried on in these uh, leaders, although they do not function as kings, okay, uh, because they will not go back and establish a monarchy. They are under the administrative rule of the Persians, the, the satraps, and then uh, governors, okay? Uh, the second migra migration will take place in 458 BC, and we could kind of label these the reinforcements. And this is when Ezra comes, OK? So although um, we're starting with Ezra chapter 1 and the return, Ezra doesn't really show up in the narrative until several chapters in with this second um, reinforcement migration. And then the third migration takes place in 444 BC. Uh, and this is probably a much smaller migration um, uh, with Nehemiah, okay? And this is the rebuilders of the wall, the wall of Jerusalem. So just as we saw, there were three uh, stages of deportation, three waves of deportation. So now there will be three waves of return, three waves of migrations back to the promised land. Uh, this is a graphic from the Crossways uh, resources that shows the reigns of the various emperors in the Persian Empire. You see that Cyrus, uh, his reign was not all that long, okay, only about eight years. Uh, but then you've got the successive Persian emperors here. And then what's happening in Judah concurrent to these emperors because there are references to these as we go through Ezra and Nehemiah. Okay. I do want to make one clarification, however. Um, Harry Went in his Crossways Resources has Ezra down here. There is a debate about the dating of Ezra because we're told that uh, his migration comes under the reign of Artaxerxes, okay? And you see that there's several Artaxerxes. Um, the traditional view, and the one that I'll be taking here, is that he came during the reign of Artaxerxes I, 
And that would seem more reasonable if you're just saying Artaxerxes, you usually assume you know, it's the, the first one here. Uh, but there are some, and Harry Wendt takes the position that he's under the, the second Artaxerxes that he came back. So I'm going to be placing him up here uh, in the same reign, <coughs> a same reign of the same emperor uh, who sent forth both Ezra then and Nehemiah. And actually, Ezra comes 13 years before Nehemiah does. So just for that clarification. But what we're looking at here uh, will be then the return under Sheshbazar. And the first thing that these pioneers do when they arrive is set up the altar of sacrifice. Remember that altar that was outside of the temple building itself? But it was the bronze altar where animals were sacrificed. So that's the first thing that they set up. Uh, really shows their first intention is to honor God with uh, the building of the, the temple um, uh, structure. And so the altar is the first thing. And then they begin rebuilding the actual temple building itself. Okay, And uh, so that's what we'll be considering here. But uh, before we look at those historical events, I think it's good to get a sense of the spirit of the people, uh, the expectations of the people at this time. And um, when the Jews, we know when they were coming back, they were expecting a, a, a glorious new land like a new Eden. And quite possibly that's because of the uh, prophecies of Ezekiel that we looked at yesterday. Remember, uh, he had the, the language in, in his prophecies of the return, which would be a kind of second exodus, back to a land that would be like the second creation, uh, a new Eden. Uh, he's speaking, though, apocalyptically, symbolically, and yet they were seeing this as very literal and we're expecting to, to come back to a virtual Garden of Eden. And so when they came back and saw that it was anything but paradise, everything but the Garden of Eden, there was great disappointment. Um, those who returned in, to Judah were grief-stricken. Okay. Again, they had hoped that they would return to a messianic age, the virtual Garden of Eden, but what they found was a mess. Everything is in ruins. The people who actually continued to live there um, were in dire poverty, just living in the ruins, um, scraping out an existence. And so uh, that was disappointing, and to say the least, here. Uh, also now, uh, with their hopes for the Messianic kingdom to begin, the question is, uh, the king, who had been deported from Judah, Jehoiachin, has died in Babylon. Okay, So what of the Davidic dynasty? It appears to be null in 538. They can't establish a kingship in the new land because they're under the occupation of the Persians. Okay, They'll have administrators. They'll have satraps. They'll have um, governors but no king. So what of that promise of the Davidic monarchy uh, and dynasty? That's up for, for grabs. And so the question, when will that Davidic dynasty be restored? These are questions that they face. So let's begin looking at the first migration in 538 BC with that decree of Cyrus. The figurehead leader is Sheshbazar, again, that descendant, possibly a son of Jehoiachin. Um, and, and yet, the most significant figure for you to know is Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. And uh, Zerubbabel now will become uh, the, the, the one who eclipses Sheshbazar in these early chapters of, of Ezra in terms of the leader of the people, although Sheshbazar originally is. Uh, there's also another individual named 
Jeshua or Yeshua, same as Joshua. And sometimes you'll even read the, the, the name uh, transliterated as Joshua, translated as Joshua. But this is the same name later on that uh, the Messiah will be given, Yeshua, okay, Jesus. So uh, the same name. This Jeshua is the high priest. And so he's the one who kind of now begins the priestly activities of the people as they have returned. But what they return to is just a bunch of rubble and ruins uh, from the conquest. Jerusalem is just a pile of, of broken down blocks and stones and so forth, a few piled here and there. Uh, but the walls are, are crumbled, the buildings are crumbled, the temple is uh, just uh, a pile of, of stones. And as I said before, the first thing that they do is build the altar of burnt offering. Okay, uh, and so they build that um, somewhat crude uh, altar to to begin with, but so that they can begin once again the Levitical sacrifices um, upon Mount Zion. They were not carrying out sacrifices in Babylon because there's only one place that you can do that, and that is on Mount Zion. And so now they're able to resume that because they're back in the land. And they begin um, developing plans for the temple, for the building of the temple. So that's the very first thing, and you've got to give them credit. They're getting their priorities right. Uh, the Lord comes first. Uh, he's the one to be uh, attended to first, his house. So uh, the question is, however, in these early chapters, when will the temple finally be completed? When will that take place? So again, in terms of our chronology here, the return, the altar is set up. Temple rebuilding begins, the laying of the, the foundation, Joshua and Zerubbabel are the two leaders, Joshua of the tribe of Levi and the line of Aaron, a priest, Zerubbabel of the line of David, a uh, tribe of Judah. So uh, there's this hope. But uh, you notice here that they begin building right, right away, probably around 536 is when they begin building the temple, but it's not dedicated until 515 and in fact, uh, there's a hiatus, and it's not resumed until 520. So what's the story behind that? Well, the book of Ezra t tells us here, but here's some characteristics, first of all, of the book of Ezra. It begins where Second Chronicles ends, okay? So it is a continuing narrative, uh, probably from the same author. The focus is on the rebuilding of the temple and reestablishment of the covenant community. So that's the main theme of the book of Ezra. Uh, that's something that might appear on the exam here. That the main theme here is the rebuilding of the temple, the reestablishment of the covenant community. Okay. Um, it contains a lot of quotes from written documents and decrees from the per Persian Empire emperors. Cyrus, Artaxerxes, Darius. And you see that already here in chapter 1, uh, beginning with verse 2. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, and then his edict, his decree there. And so we find a number of these. And this is unique then in the book of Ezra and also Nehemiah. So again, if there's a question on the uh, competency exam uh, about which book, has uh, edicts and written documents, decrees from foreign emperors uh, written down verbatim for you. And there's multiple choice options. Uh, Ezra would be a good choice for you to, to make on that. Okay. Uh, who is Ezra? Ezra is a priest. He is also a priest, the priestly line. Uh, 
His main focus, however, will be there are essentially two functions that priests carry out. The function of mediating the sacrifices, uh, administering the uh, means of grace of Old Testament Israel and the sacrifices, um, and then also teaching the scriptures, and especially teaching the Torah, the Pentateuch, five books of, of Moses. And uh, so Ezra's primary focus is on that latter part of teaching the people, reestablishing the covenant community around the law, around the Torah. Okay? But he doesn't come until a little bit later in the narrative, but I just wanted to share who he is. Here's the chronology in the first six chapters of Ezra. Okay, so we have the return under Sheshbazer in 538, that's that first migration, and that's described in chapter 1 of Ezra. Uh, then you have in chapter 2 just a listing of, of how many came back, uh, the number uh, of, of those who came back, and it uh, amounts to about 50,000. So in this uh, first migration, there's about 50,000 Jews who returned. This is not the majority of Jews. Uh, most of them remain in Babylon. They've got so settled in that they choose to remain in Babylon. And there will be a significant Jewish community in Babylon. In fact, uh, up until recent time, uh, there were Jews in Iraq okay, that continued on. But there's a highly significant um, school of rabbis uh, in Babylon and uh, uh, some of the best texts of the Old Testament and such that we have were preserved by the Jews in Babylon. So there's still a significant community that remain in Babylon. Um, but those who do return, about 50,000, start rebuilding. The first thing that they rebuild is the altar. Okay, that um, is described then in chapter 3, first part, that altar of burnt offering. And then they begin construction of the temple building itself uh, under Zerubbabel in 536 B.C. And this is the latter part of chapter 3. They essentially just get the foundation laid. Okay, and... Um, um, uh, and that's where it stalls. And the reason it stalls is that there's opposition to the rebuilding that uh, stalls out the reconstruction process for about 16 years. And that's described in chapter 4. I'll give greater detail about that here shortly. And so it's not until 516 B.C., through the encouragement of two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, that um, the temple is completed, and that's in chapters 5 and 6. Okay, so this is now where we want to place these two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, in the context of the rebuilding of the temple. Okay? This uh, completion of the temple was encouraged by Haggai and Zechariah, and uh, we read about them actually in Ezra uh, chapter 5, where it says, Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, helping them. Okay, so now we were placing, in terms of their historical context, these two prophets Haggai and Zechariah. Haggai is traditionally understood to be an older man, Zechariah a younger man. 